want you to know that this is such a rare privilege to be able to speak to you. Do you, I don't know if you know this or not, but speaking to you was on my bucket list for years. Yes, I have a bucket list. It gets bigger every year. I keep thinking, I keep crossing things off and I keep adding things. So the bucket just keeps getting bigger. But you know what? You're wedged right in between zip lining over the Niagara Falls and visiting Hawaii. You're nestled right in there, okay? Because I really thought that I would probably have to zip line over Niagara Falls before I'd ever be allowed to speak up here. <laughs> but I am so thrilled to be here and I thank you uh, so much for the privilege and the honor. And I know that I have um, family online watching me in Arizona and Florida, and I just want to say hi to them. And um, I love you, and I thank you for your prayers. And I thank you for all of those that have been praying. I want to tell you that it has been definitely felt. I have never felt more peace, more assurances. I actually did not worry about being in front of you. I don't know, maybe some of you don't know this, but I find this stage very intimidating. I always have. I don't know why, but I have. And so coming up here, I didn't have those worries and those fears, and I know that's because of your prayers. So I thank you, I thank you. Um, in trying to figure out what I was gonna teach on today, um, I just kind of opened up uh, my devotional, and many of you uh, probably have heard of Rick Renner's Sparkling Gems, and I use that as one of the things that I go to when I want to spend some time with God, because I like the fact that it always challenges me. And so I was reading a devotional, and it talked about the Bible verses that we're going to be doing today, which is Matthew 28. Uh, 19 and 20, and Mark 16, 15 through 18. We're going to be doing those two verses today. But what I want to tell you is that when I was reading it, I was like, I just want you to know that it never dawned on me that that would be what I would be speaking on, the Great Commission. I really just kind of kept an open slate before the Lord because I didn't want to presume too much. And I don't want to miss what God wants to use me for. So I just kind of had an open slate. And when I was reading it, I was going, oh my gosh, this is so good. I love this. And the Lord was like, yeah, yeah, that's right. You're going to be teaching on it. And I'm like, huh? And I'm like, what? Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> so um, what he's done is really enlarge my understanding, and I hope yours today, about what it means to be a part of the Great Commission. Now, I will tell you that as we're getting ready to have the first slide of Matthew, verses Matthew 28, 19, and 20, while that's going on, I want to tell you something. When we think of nations and worlds, I'm very generic. You know, I, I am not the sharpest tool in the shed. I am the first to admit it, okay? Seriously. But um, what I love and what I learned about nation and worlds, for just from the little bit that I kind of studied and, and read from that devotion of Rick Renner, um, he really enlarged my vision. Now when we think about nations, we probably think of different countries, right? different cultures, different backgrounds. And we think of worlds, I think of different continents and third world countries and things of that nature. And that's always kind of been my preface. But I've really been challenged in looking at the Greek, uh, after, and we'll get to that slide later, but there are two things that these verses say. There's an ethnos, which talks about, and that's the Greek word, and in English it means nations. And then there's cosmos. It's a Greek word, meaning a world system or order. So we're going to look at those two things, and I'm going to be talking about that. So with the first Bible verse, we're going to go to Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. 
Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded to you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now the reason I'm not reading out of this is because this prints little. And my eyes don't see little anymore. Welcome to the 50s. <laughs> Life in the 50s. Somebody give her a big <laughs> So I read it off of there. But I love it that it said to go into all the nations. Well, when we talk about ethnos, it describes culture, races, people of every color, civilization. That shows our neighborhoods. Okay, now just so you know, I know that we live in Warren County. I know there aren't a whole lot of different cultures in Warren County. We're kind of like a little gem. We're so unlike other areas. We have a few African American. We have a few Guatemalan. Yes, I know of at least three. Two of them are the pastor's kids. When we have a few Hispanic. But for the most part, differing cultures, we really probably don't see a whole lot, right? And the only thing I could really come, come close to saying would be a different culture would be the Amish in Sugar Grove. Would you agree that is totally a different culture? That is a culture that I respect but I never, want, I never want to be Amish. I can't wear those clothes. I cannot wear those clothes. I am sorry, I am a fashion diva. It will not work. I cannot do it. But I love the fact that nations here doesn't necessarily mean we have to go and expend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of sacrifice to go minister to people. We can look within our own community, our own neighborhood. And let me tell you, with PF's region, that's a lot of neighborhoods. Oh my goodness, we go from like Mayville to Kane. It's like awesome. So if we include every neighborhood, because that's who represents us, that we'd be influencing a lot of people, wouldn't you say? Yes. So, I just really love that we don't have to spend. Now, if you are a missionary and you are a full-time missionary, hats off to you. I respect those that have done that and, and have done it for years. I am not called to that, but I respect every person that is. So I'm not begrudging that and I'm not belittling it. I'm just saying that in this day and age, we need to be looking at our neighborhood and saying, okay, Lord, send me, even in your own neighborhood. I will tell you that along that line, that my husband and I, and I don't know why we do this, we just do. When we see new neighbors, we welcome the new neighbors. People think we are the weirdest people. And they're not too far off. <laughs> Truth be told. Okay, just, say, just putting that disclaimer out there. Um, but we, and Kevin and I, when we decided to live where we lived, we wanted to be a part of a community. We wanted to know our neighbor. It was important to us. Um, so we would many times go out and say hello. If we see neighbors out, we'll go over and we'll talk with them. Some of them, I have no idea who they are. I don't know what their lifestyle is. Um, some of them actually look high and while others look drunk, it didn't matter to me. It did not matter to me because they're God's creation, right? God created them, God loves them, we'd better love them. And what better way to show that love but just to be friendly, 
just be accommodating. Now, there are times, I will say, that being friendly has its sacrifices when they come to your door at 11 o'clock at night and they decide that, they've, that you have a car that they would like you to take them somewhere at 11 o'clock and they don't ask, they just assume that because you have a car and you're friendly, you're going to take them. <laughs> They're so cute. So, and so we've had to draw some boundaries I am more than happy to take you to the store, but I'm in my jammies. People don't want to see Mrs. Amy in her jammies. Believe me, I've seen me in my jammies. You don't want to see it, okay? Just don't want to see it. So, but at any rate, you still, we still, my husband and I, wanted to be influencers. And this is something I didn't talk about in the 9 a.m. service, but God reminded me that I needed to touch on this for this service to be influencers. That's really what the Great Commission is. You're influencing another culture, another world, another system for him. So now we're gonna go into cosmos, which is the Greek word for a world system. It could be a political system. It could be all kinds of different things. But it can also be this, the workplace, the school you attend, the soccer or softball team that you're either on or your coach. It can be the, where you volunteer your time. It can even be at a vacation Bible school. It's right around the corner. You're not gonna wanna miss it. <laughs> it really is, August 12th to 16th, it's right around the corner. <laughs> so the college that you'll be attending it can be anything, any one of those, and so much more. There's so much more. I mean, the list could be endless. It could be the gym that you go to. It could be the restaurant that you frequent. It could be the stores that you buy your clothes from. I mean, if you were to use your imagination about what this could mean, you would realize that you are literally in an... I'm not sure what that... Yes, Lord, <laughs> did, I, did I miss something? I, I'm so sorry. I just, you know, if I, if I get way late, he just brings me right back. So I, I'm, I'm gonna do better, Lord. So, but it can be all those things. And I wanna tell you something. When it comes to the world, where it means order, or where there's systems in place, one of the things that Rick Renner stated, and I really, really admire this, respect this, and so understand this. He said that Satan is known to work in world systems. The ones that many, like I've mentioned already. And that this is where he can exhibit some of his greatest influence. Well, don't we know that's the truth? It's in our music. It's in our media, it's in the paper, it's in a political system, it's in every shape and form in our lives. Satan's influence. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't like that so well. I've always often thought of myself as an influencer for the children. I influence their thinking, I challenge their thinking. I want them to think beyond themselves to a God that loves them, created them, made them the way they're supposed to be made, and created them with a purpose and a plan. And because of that, I don't like the fact that they're influencing their schools and their music, their gaming. Even the gaming is so influenced. Now, I mean to tell you, that is not I'm not about whoa and all that, that's not who I am. But we need to know that because if we're going to be influencers for Christ, we're gonna have to invade those areas for God. Your sphere of influence may very well be in any one of those categories. One of those for me Believe it or not, it's Facebook. I like Facebook. I can get caught up in it if I'm not careful. But let me tell you, 
anyone that looks at my Facebook, you will not see someone begrudging, complaining. I'm all about God's love, God's redemptive power, and loving people right where they are. Whether they believe or they don't is inconsequential to me. That's just one. That's just one sphere of influence. Now I'm going to tell you that in Mark 16, 15 through 18, it says that we're to go into all of creation. Well, here's a thought. I kind of have a feeling that when they were talking about this, it had nothing to do with the bear, the squirrel, the chipmunk, the skunk, and the deer that are in our area. I think they pretty well got it under control. I think they know who their creator is. So I think we're good to go, okay? Now, if you want to feed them, that's up to you. I don't feed the bear. And I live in town, I, I have people that feed the bear, I don't understand that, and then they wonder why they're trying, and then they wonder why they're on their porch. Uh, well, maybe because you fed the bear? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not about that, okay? What I am about is about what I believe it means, and that means the creation he's talking about is man and woman, boy and girl. And it says to go into all of creation. Does it say some of creation? Does it say just the ones we like? Does it say just the ones we're, we're comfortable with? No, it says all of creation. So that really takes on a whole new meaning if you look at all. So that could mean, that does mean your neighborhood. That does mean the people that maybe don't like you, don't understand you. Maybe think you're squirrely. I know I've been told that I'm a little squirrely. I'm still trying to figure out what that means. But at any rate, I'll take it. That's okay by me. And you know what? I tell the kids, whenever you come to someone that says you're a little squirrely or they don't understand you, you and I tell them, you tell them, well, you'll have to talk to God about that because he created me and I like me just fine. Because, quite honestly, we have too many people telling us what we do wrong and what we aren't more than we have people telling us who our identity is and who we are. Amen. And I really want our children to know their identity in Christ. That is like paramount to me. If they don't learn anything else, they will learn two things. They will understand God's love and want a relationship with him and they will understand their identity in him because those two have to go together if they're going to influence our world. Now, if we believe, if I believe that children can do that, I know you grown-ups can. I know you can. So, my question to you today is very simply, who's your sphere of influence? Who is it that you have that maybe you haven't even thought about? Maybe there's a particular population. Maybe there's a particular uh, area. Maybe there are people that you haven't even thought about reaching. Well, I wanna challenge you today to think about that. What I would like to share with you today is very simple. And it really stems around um, Diane Sherman who um, had a dream about the House of Hope. And uh, she was going into the jail ministry. And she needed someone to go with her in the jail ministry. She needed other people. And I remember her talking about it, and I remember telling her that I'd be praying about it. So that's exactly what I did. I just went before God, and I lifted her up. And, and for some reason that particular day, I still don't understand why because I don't, I had my laptop open and I never have my laptop open. I never, when I'm having devotions, tech stuff is, is away from me. Even the music is, is at an ar arm's length away from me. And, but for some reason I had the, the laptop open and I had, um, 
And so I, I felt led to get on the emails and I felt the Holy Spirit say this, I want you to send Diane an email. And I, I, you know, and here comes the internal argument that we all do. I should know better. Why am I sending an email? I'm gonna see her in a couple days. I'll talk to her when I see her. And the Holy Spirit was like, uh-uh. You need to send her an email. And I want you to write exactly what I tell you to write. Now I had taken a class in hearing God's voice here in International School of Ministry. So I knew that when God was saying that, he had a plan. And I knew well enough just to listen and quit the arguing. He's gonna win anyways. <laughs> he always does. So I did. And what I ended up typing to her was very simply, Diane, I've been praying for you. I felt led by the Holy Spirit to tell you that I will assist you in any way, shape, or form that you need. Gave her a little bit of background for me, on me. Told her I was not qualified in the least. In the least. In my mind, I had absolutely nothing that I could share with the jail ministry. I had not been, I never, had addiction, I, unless, you, unless you count sugar. That's really it for me. I, I do have a slight addiction to sugar. I love donuts, okay? Just putting that out there. The kids already know this. I tell them this all the time. I don't know why I tell them, but I do. And so, but other than that, I just didn't have anything I thought would of any value whatsoever. And I sent it and I thought, okay, done. I just figured, well, I'll never hear another thing. <laughs> I did what you said, God. The rest is up to you. Thinking that this would never come about. And I put it on the back burner, never thought anything more of it, till three, four weeks later, Diane, I see her and she's, oh, by the way, I got your email about you helping in the jail ministry. I think that would be wonderful. I would love it. And I kind of went, uh, 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 that email? Uh, Okay, I really, it came as a total shock to me. I really did not think that I had anything to share, anything to give. I really think she, I thought maybe she'd just laugh at it and go, oh, you're so cute, you know, pat me on the back. And, um, but she, she took me under her wing and I was mentored by her for a couple of years. I went into the jail ministry and I'm still doing it to this day. I still go in on Wednesdays um, with Becky Rogowski, and we do life skills. And um, by having that relationship with the girls in the jail, and then some of them having uh, ended up going to the House of Hope, well, that just lended itself for me to help at the House of Hope because I loved the girls. I had developed a relationship with them. We had a lot of common interests. Um, and I thought this is cool, I'll just go visit them. And little did I know, I ended up helping in the House of Hope, became one of the volunteers. And um, to this day, I still do jail ministry. I do worship and prayer Wednesday nights at the House of Hope. And I'm even on the House Committee, which helps decide who's coming in and applications and things. And I don't say all this as a pat on the back because this is nothing about me. This is nothing about me, I hope you hear that. It is about God, five years ago, knew what to do, when to do it. And all I did was step in. That's all I did was step in. I didn't know what it was gonna look like. I didn't know if I would fail or it would go well. I didn't know, I just knew that when God leads you to something, he's gonna help you through it. So that's exactly what I did. To this day, and I will tell you, what does the House of Hope jail ministry have to do with children's ministry? I have no idea. I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm still trying to figure it out. But you know what? I truly do believe with everything in me then I am as called as much a children's pastor as I am to be at the House of Hope in jail ministry. God has confirmed that over and over and over again to the point where I cannot dispute it any longer. 
And what's awesome is that I love both equally. That is amazing to me, and that is all God. Now, the children part, I've always loved children. I actually wanted more children, was unable to have more children, and so that I felt like this was God's way of being a children's pastor's way of having 50, 60, 70 kids, which I just love. I get to love on them for two or three hours and then I send them home. It's perfect. I don't have to keep them quiet in school. I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. If they're going to have lunch. Are there they need to go to the bathroom for a break? Do they not? No, I just love on them. Send them home. It's worked well for umpteen years. I love what I do equally for the children and the House of Hope. The reason I'm mentioning this is because the House of Hope was never, ever on my radar. If you had said to me 10 years ago that I'd be doing this, I would have said, you are nutty. You are nuts. Because it just was not on my radar. But God, but God had a different plan. And because I was just simply willing to do what? Step in to whatever it is he had, he showed me a world of women who desperately need to know the love of God, who desperately need to know there's a way out, who desperately need to know there are options. I had no idea the passion that I would have. I say that as a, an encouragement to you that wherever you are, whatever it is that God is pricking you at, or trying to push you into, or trying to woo you to. Step in and find, taste and see, like the song says, that he is good. He's not gonna call you into something to wreck your world. He's not calling you to something to have you be involved in some ultimate failure. Yes, there's sacrifice. Yes, there's time involved. It's not always pretty. It's not always fun. Believe it or not, kids' ministry isn't always fun. There's a lot of planning. But I wouldn't trade it for the world. Now, for those of you who want to be an influencer, we have any people that want to be influencers? Not all, two people. That's so nice. <laughs> Let's try this again. Please. Don't have to get my whistle out. <laughs> Who want to influence the world for God? Yeah. And you know what? You do that every day. You do that every day when you carry the spirit of God with you. You change the environment. Now, I'm going to give you some ideas how to change your environment, how to influence you, or how to influence others for Christ. You will notice right, out, see, right outside those doors that we are going to have Vacation Bible School, August 12th and August 16th. It is so much fun. I will tell you that last year, I told this at the 9 o'clock service, last year I literally told the coordinators, all the VBS coordinators, do not plan on me. I am a no-show and a no-go. I have done it. I'm all spent. I'm used up. Not going to do it. Not going to be there. Have fun without me. In so many words. And I walked away. They were like... Well, unfortunately, I forgot to talk to the Heavenly Father about that decision. Because <laughs> he had a few other little pants. He had a few little other plans. He's like, oh, isn't she cute? Get back in there. And that's kind of like how it felt at first. Hmm, get back in there. Now, VBS, I love VBS, but it's a lot of time. It's a lot of preparation. Um, but I will tell you, in the last several years that I have done it, this year, I have been more excited about it 
more energized about doing it than I ever have in the last three or four years. I think it's just because I simply said, you know what, Lord, it isn't about my plans. It's about what you want me to do. And obviously there's a reason you want me in this. I think it would do fine without me. That's without saying. But for some reason, God says you're still in it. I want to share one other thing with you. Um, other than knowing that we do have a need in children's ministry. Do you know that in the fall, we started in just my class alone, which is a K through third with 15 people. It grew to 30 by the end of the school year. Our nursery has probably has at least five or six more babies than it did at the beginning. Our preschool, we have so many that we ended up having to divide them up between the three-year class and the four-year class because there were so many. Now it's at a, actually a much better place. It's like 10 to 14 per class, which is really a good, it's a good amount. I think it's a, a safe amount to have. Um, that it makes it fun to have that many. You can play games and different things with them, be in it more interactive with them. But because of the sheer number of children, we need more helpers and we need more teachers. Um, I know, I will tell you, I didn't tell this at the nine o'clock uh, service, but I will tell you, I know that I'm being called out to speak more. I know that because God said that about three months ago. He says you need to prepare because you're going to be called out and you're going to go out and you're going to speak. Whether it's for God or for the house of hope remains to be seen. But because of that, I have to prepare for that because sometimes there are going to be Sundays when Mrs. Amy will not be available. Is that most of the time? No. But there will be a time on occasion that I will not be available. And I need to have teachers there that can do the lesson. Now, I send out the lessons. I either write the lessons or we buy the lessons. So a teacher does not have to come up with a lesson. I do that. Um, our preschool, threes and fours, same thing. They have a curriculum that they use. Um, we have helpers down there. We're only asking for one Sunday a month. Literally, one Sunday a month. That's it. Whether you're in nursery, Epic Minis, whether you're in three and four class, whether you're in my class, one Sunday a month, that's it. What's cool is that you also can go, you don't miss anything because you're gonna get to go to the 9 a.m. service. So when you come in 10.30, you're not missing anything. So it's a win-win. Before, you literally sacrificed. When we didn't have two services, you, that person literally sacrificed. They had to watch it online or whatever. So I challenge you today if God's pricking your heart, and it's for children, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to rationalize it? Say, no, I, not for me. I don't do children. I don't even know, I don't even know if I like children. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I can honestly tell you this. I don't even know if I'd like jail ministry. It scared the bejeebers out of me. All I knew the jail ministry was what I saw in criminal intent and SVU. I was scared out of my gourd. I thought I'm gonna be knifed. I mean, all these, all the, I know, I know Becky and I can laugh about this because we know better. But I'm like, I'm only going on what I know. What I know scared the bejeebers out of me. So I know what it feels like to be in fear and still stepping into something. But do you have the courage and do you have the audacity? Do you have the wherewithal today to decide that you're gonna do what God's put on your heart to do and be an influencer? I'm tired of Satan influencing our children. It's not okay. It's not okay. And so when it comes to influencing children, I want them to be influenced by the Holy Spirit. I want them to see men and women loving God, loving life, have real joy downstairs with our kids. Because they need to see that. 
They need to see men and women who love people, love God, and are willing to give a little bit of time to show what the love of Jesus looks like. If you're one of those people, great. Meet us out there and we'll show you how. If you children aren't your thing, look at your sphere of influence. Who is your sphere of influence? Be challenged by the people around you. Be challenged by the neighbor that walks up and down your sidewalk day after day. Be influencers when you're at the market. Be influencers when you're at Walmart. Oh my goodness, if, if anything, anything takes patience, it takes going to Walmart and waiting one of those lines. You can show God just by being patient. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I stood in line for I don't know how long yesterday. And I'm like, Lord, if I go off, this is not good. This is not good. It's going to be on Facebook. It's going to be on YouTube. And goodbye, good night, nurse. That's all she wrote. So are you saying we should stop hiding from people at Walmart? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I've already, I already saw you twice. <laughs> I was the one that went up there and said, Julie Fofani, you have a call on line one. No, not really. <laughs> so today I just really want to pray us out I want you to be challenged today this isn't about making you feel guilty this is about you stepping into what God has for you and not being afraid of it not being scared you're going to be a failure not be, being afraid that you're not enough or you don't have enough education pish posh pish posh I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I thought that. Because God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. That's right. So let's pray. Amen. Father God, we thank you for an opportunity of being in your presence because worship was like sitting in your lap today. I so loved worship and it was so beautiful and it was so spot on with what was needed in the teaching today. I love how you knit all that together. But Father God, I pray that you be with the people today. I pray, Lord, that you would go out and you would, Lord, just your Holy Spirit would inspire, Father God, people to step out of their comfort zone. People to step out into the unknown, to believe for something bigger than what they see in front of them. To want more, to want to minister more, to want to influence a community, a neighborhood, a nation, a world for you once again. Help us to see what that looks like individually and collectively. And I thank you, Father God, for these amazing people who you love, I love, are like, they're like my extended family. Father God, I thank you for every single one of them because they are here for a reason and a purpose. This year, this day, they're meant to do something bigger and better, way beyond their own imaginations. And I pray, Father God, you help them to see that into fruition. I thank you and I pray that you would bless everyone to hear, everyone here today, amen. I just want to read something. Um, it has to do with the Kenya team, and specifically, I just heard it in my head over and over again as Amy was talking. And I think it just encourages all of us and encourages all of us um, to step out because it takes courage to step out. I get that. It takes courage. But it was actually written by Rashad, Julian Sadiq's Rashad, and maybe you saw it already on Facebook. But it's about something that Rashad and John Page did on the trip. One experience that, this is Rashad writing, one experience I had on this trip was very special and touching. It began with me, I'll try not to cry. It began with me and John doing some evangelism in the slums. Going into this, I had no clue or expectations about what I was going to see, and neither did John. We headed out and met a few people on the road and did our thing and I got an idea of what it was going to be like and I could handle it. As we kept going on, we came to this huge dump and saw some rough looking people who were disgusted by us. Oh, sorry. This changed my idea of what I was going into. Some of these people were drunk and drugged out 
and this was a bit intimidating. But because I'm outgoing, I approached them and made them laugh. Befriending them, helped them, accept me. That was a very big breakthrough. So they invited us into this dump, but it was their home. This shocked me a lot. There were probably about 25 people in the slum. These people literally lived in trash huts, and they were all orphans. They told us they would have killed us if we would have went on to their land without befriending them first. That was crazy to think that we were that close to dying. But as we went on, we could see that these people were really good people. John was able to get them pray with us, and that was insane. These people wanted God in their lives. So we asked them to come to our sports day at the church in Kipsongo the next day, and they said yes. I, I met a guy named Mike, and I told him if he came, I would give him my Timberland boots. He said that would change his life. That touched me deeply because people in America take getting shoes and new things for granted. So to see and hear someone's life getting changed by a pair of boots was very special. When we went to church the next day, they were all there. That was, <laughs> sorry, that was so amazing. <laughs> Me and John flipped. When I gave Mike the shoes, he started to tear up. And I knew that the shoes really did change his life. I hope that God can do many more life-changing things and miracles. Several of the people from the dump accepted Christ that day. Rashad, 14, and John, 16. If the two of them can do that, we can do it. 